What's doing, everybody? Welcome to First Class Fatherhood. I'm Alec Lace, and before I hit you with today's interview, make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel and hit the link in the description so you can listen to all of the interviews I've done with so many tremendous dads, including Dana White, Deion Sanders, Tony Hawk, and so many others. Now let's get going with today's interview. Joining me now, First Class Father, Gino Caffarelli. Welcome to First Class Fatherhood. Oh, thank you so much, man. I'm uh, I'm so honored to be here. All right, let's start it like this. How many kids you have? How old? Uh, she's she's going to be seven actually on Friday, and it's uh, I got one. I have one girl. We have one girl. Okay, what type of sports or activities is she into? Um, she loves to swim. She's kind of a little bit. Of, uh, I the the little joke is that she's kind of a little uncoordinated in in uh, in, in the whole um, you know kind of, she could kind of like you know trip over a feather. But she's been lo- she's been loving the swimming. So um, I've been wanting her to maybe get into like soccer. Uh, but as far as you know, what what she really loves to do is she loves to swim. She loves the water. Uh, okay, very cool. If you could, you yeah. know, please uh, just take a minute here to hit my listeners with a little bit about your background and what you do. Uh, well, I was, uh, I was mainly, um, in corporate America all my life. I was, uh, born and raised in Queens all my life. Uh, Astoria, Flushing, Whitestone, Bayside area. Um, went to Catholic school, went to an old boy high school, went to St. John's. And then I was kind of like on the, uh, 11 year program with St. John's <laughs> because mm-hmm. I wanted to kind of start working right away. So I started selling cars for Saturn. Do you remember that car company? Yeah. So I started, yeah, I started selling Saturns and, and going to school at night. Um, but originally when I was in college, I, I, um, I started with a, um, I started in the pharmacy program. I made the pharmacy program. I was book smart in school. Um, but I always kind of wanted to get into the, uh, into the arts, being an actor and a filmmaker. Um, so I did various sales jobs, but any sales job that I ever took, I always either believed in the service or the product. So anything I ever sold, I really believed in. So I was mainly in corporate America all my life and then just decided really like in 2006, kind of like pick everything and uh, pick up and go and, and move to L.A. just to get away from New York. Not not to really go out there with like, oh, I have a, a set dream. I had some friends out there. I wanna, wanted to take a little break from New York. And I went out to L.A. and just kind of like just you know, chilled out there for a little bit. And things kind of like started kind of like chipping away and happened organically. Uh, and then I came back to New York uh, to work on a passion project, and then I just wound up staying. Yeah, very cool, Gino. And and, and along this uh, journey here, about how old were you then when you first became a dad, and how did becoming a father kind of change your perspective on life? So, so I was I turned forty in LA, came back to New York uh, a couple of years after that. So she's going to be seven. I'm fifty one. I'm doing the math. So I was 44 when I, when I had a kid. So I kind of, I kind of started late. Um, I started late. Like my friends were like, like they had like teenagers and had kids going to college. Like I was like, wow. I'm like, but I, you know, I guess you say, you know, better, better late than never. Um, you know, how's it changed me? Um, a lot of, I knew I was going to have a girl <laughs> because I did a little mischievous, you know, mischievous things that I've, I've done as a boy, I guess, growing up. Uh, but it just, it, um, puts a, you just look at things a lot differently, like, especially during this pandemic and, 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 um, a lot of people living out of fear and worry and stuff. The number one priority that really scared me the most. I mean, my parents are still around, knock on wood. They're, they're older, you know, you know, uh, scared about kind of like, you know, getting them sick and like making sure they're safe. But again, number one priority being family, but being a dad, like she's going to be seven. She's still a kid. You know, like I just saw just a lot of people getting sick and just it just scared me. Like I want to be I want to be around like forever for my kid because I have a very close relationship with my daughter. I spend a lot of time, even though she doesn't live with me, she lives with her mom. She spends a lot of time with me and been spending a lot more time with me during the pandemic because uh, my ex is, uh, she's in the uh, essential world. Uh, her family owns convenience stores, like drive-through convenience stores. So the business kind of like really took off and she was really busy. So I, I spent a lot of more, more time with my daughter. And the challenging part of that was the whole homeschooling. That was, that was pretty challenging. So I got yeah. to have with that. 
Yeah, we, we've all been struggling a little bit with that. The teachers have been doing a great job. I know with my kids, they've been they've been very good with the Zoom calls and, and all that stuff, staying on top of them. Like I said, I got four kids myself, and my oldest will be starting high school next year. So it's kind of one of those years for me where I have an eighth grader who's supposed to be graduating eighth grade, and I have a kindergartner, my last kindergartner, who's supposed to have that going on, and um, both haven't happened yet. I don't know. We'll see if something comes together. But the teachers have been doing a great job. And now that you said, um, you know, you, you have your uh, a, a daughter with your with your ex, uh, for a lot of single dads out there, uh, one of the struggles that they have or one of the things that's tough to decide is when do you feel like you would be OK introducing your daughter to a new potential a girlfriend or spouse that you would be dating? At what point in a new relationship would you feel comfortable doing that? Um, well, it's been a, it's been a few years. I mean, uh, my ex, we're like best friends. She's she's amazing. She comes from a great family. She's Greek and I'm Italian. So it kind of like the best of both worlds um italian and greek so for her first name you know being greek and last name being italian she sounds like more the actress than anything <laughs> um i'm real careful about that i mean i've introduced her to uh an ex that i was dating for say about six months so i'm, I'm kind of really careful about that because i don't know i just um i feel like i have such a, an amazing relationship with her i don't want to introduce her to somebody um right away that you know I don't know. I'm I'm kind of very, you know very you know very um, ner not nervous about that. I'm looking for the word. It's just um, you know you know I kind of like keep try to keep my my life a little private, being that I'm in the entertainment industry. But I, I'll know when the time is right to you know because I really I I, I say straight out to, to either you know girls that I I date or um, you know girls that I've been on a, a few dates with like my priority and i'm not trying to sound like you know like i'm not trying to sound like an, you know an ass or like i say my number one priority is being a dad like that my daughter and again it may come off i don't want to come off like you know cocky like that and like like being like this is the only girl in my life she comes first she really does she's like number one priority in my life um i love my work I, you know I'm, I'm very i bury myself into my work and my, and my family so i i kind of said it like daughter you know you know friends and, and family and and my career um and i know that's hard for a girl to kind of understand unless she's in the same situation it's much harder if a girl doesn't have a kid i have kids some of them get a little jealous i don't know why i mean it's a little girl they should respect that i'd rather have you know um uh, a girl or a woman be like you know I, I love and and certain girls do say that they're like i i, I love how you are with your daughter that's that's amazing i think that's beautiful you're you're an incredible dad which they say you're an incredible human, you know, because a lot, a lot of dads don't spend a lot of time with their kids, which I, I find kind of weird, too. Like, I'm not the type of dad to, like, see my daughter once a week. I just I just can't do that. I'm like, yeah. oh, I have to see her a lot more. Yeah, very, very well said, you know, and you're right about that. I mean, that, that's one of the encouraging things to hear you talk like that, because we have a fatherless crisis in our country right now. And, and so I many know. guys so I don't get that. Me neither. And it's so many guys that are in a situation like yours where it's, uh, you know, they do put the onus on themselves. They put the focus on themselves in their own personal life and don't put the kids first. And I think we see devastating results in our society as a result of that. Yeah, I mean, and, it, you know, it is hard to juggle, you know, like, again, I'm just, a, I, I would say, still grinding along, have had some great accomplishments, but I'm still grinding along. And my career is important, but my kid comes first. So juggling, being a dad, career, my, my you know, my, my dad's, he just turned 80 during the pandemic. We had, we had, we had a party planned and it didn't happen. So, you know, I still, you know, knock on wood, I still have my parents. And again, you know, Italians being very, you know, family oriented and family and, and even, even with the Greeks, I, um, it's just, it's hard to juggle, but I, I, I've always been able to multitask, you know, like back, maybe back 10, 20 years ago, they were like, you got to focus on one thing. And now, you know, the term renaissance man or renaissance woman has become like, you know, a cool thing where before they're like, you just got to focus on one thing. You can't be all over, you know, not that I'm all over the place, but they're like, you got to focus on one thing. I think multitasking, if, if you can do it, do it. Because if I just kind of like just concentrated on one thing, I would get like nothing done. And, and I'm good at it. So I kind of like, almost like I put a pie together. I'm like, this is, you know, this is the amount of time I spend today on my daughter. This is the amount of time I spend on my, my family and friends. And this is the amount of time I spend on my work. So I try to, I try to like, 
you know, set, I don't want to say schedule because sometimes you go off schedule, but I do the best I could to priority because I tell my friends this all the time and you wouldn't hear me talking like this 10 years ago, 20 years ago, the clock is ticking. You can't beat time. Like the, the, the clock is always ticking. And that's one thing that's never been defeated is time. So try to plan your, your time accordingly as you get older. Yeah. Yeah. Very well said, you know, and, and a struggle for a lot of us with that work, life, family balance. And I think like along what you said there, the most important thing is to be present no matter which one of those categories you're in at the moment and be totally yeah. there. So um, what about as far as discipline goes, do you know what type of disciplinarian are you as a dad? And is it different than the discipline style that you grew up with? Well, again, I came from, uh, you know, the old school of, you know, my parents came from a small little town in Italy called Pietra Pertosa from the city of Potenza, which is in the south, which is on the hill. I mean, I, I learned English in school. I only spoke Italian as a kid. They came here in like 1968. So that discipline one, you know, I, I don't think I went out, out with my friends, like out with like a curfew out until I was about 16. Um, so, uh, you know, um, there's, there, you know, people, you know, people that have older kids now, they're like, well, wait until she turns 13 and she becomes a teenager and she's, you know, she's going to, that's going to kind of like change. She's going to, she'll spend a lot more, l less time with you and a lot more time with her friends. Um, it's more, you know, it, I know it's more of a, a coddle and, 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 you know, uh, you know, um, treating with, 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 um, white gloves because it's a lot different than how we grew up. Um, she's very sensitive, my daughter. So when I kind of like either reprimand her, she gets very like, you're mad at me, but your daddy's mad. I'm like, I'm not mad. I'm just trying to explain the good and the bad. Like there's, you know, you can't do that. You know, whether she does, she, she, she doesn't have patience. So we're trying to teach her about patience and stuff. And she, you know, this iPad, um, situation, it's good and bad. And just, just a couple of days ago, she's on her iPad and she's walking with it as we're walking out of my place. And she's like, kind of like tripping. I'm like, you got to not look at the iPad when you're walking and put it down when you're walking. And she got like upset about it. She's like, you're mad at me. But now in the last couple of days, I say, I say, Athena, I say, um, you know, when we leave the house, you got to put your iPad down and then you can look at it in the car if you want. And she's like, OK. And then she puts it down. And so um, it's hard because I'm very sensitive. And I'm kind of, And my ex, she says, you're a sucker. You put, you know, you like she. She tugs at your strings and she gets you all the time. And she does. I mean, she's she's the love of my life. So I'm kind of, you know, very, um, you know, I, I give in very I give in very quickly sometimes. But um, the hardest part about discipline is um, trying to get her on trying different foods. You know, she's fixated on chicken nuggets and fries and, you know, and um, she's not into vegetables unless it's pureed and. She, she, she hates the smell of cheese and she doesn't want to try pizza. I'm like, so trying to figure that, you know, that out has been very challenging because I want her to eat healthier. So we try to kind of like compensate the proteins with like great yogurt with low sugar and stuff like that. So there's a lot of, I still, you know, got work to do, but so far so good. Yeah, that's cool, Gino. And yeah, it's definitely uh, some patience needed at the dinner table in my house as well with the uh, four kids and four different types of interests and foods. And my youngest is my daughter, too. So when it comes to discipline, it's been a complete shift after going from having the three boys and, and feeling comfortable with the way I was disciplining them to now adding the girl and having to, uh, you know, uh, try to adjust. It's, it's It's been a bit of a challenge because she's the love of my life, as you'd said there. And uh, so I, I, it's a learning process for myself as well. And I know you, you, you had been busy during this pandemic. You're working on a children's book. What was the genesis of the children's book? What is it about? And when can we expect to see it? So um, the key word, I guess, when the pandemic hit, I had a few projects lined up as a filmmaker to do some independent uh, either pilots or, or you know, uh, uh, pitch presentations for films. Um, you know, the auditioning stop with, with certain, you know, with, with certain TV shows and, and films. So I, you know, the key word is adapt. So I had, I had the book and the deal with the publisher and I was, you know, you know, moving along, writing the book. But then when the pandemic hit, I'm like, well, I have to kind of like shift. So I concentrated more on writing the book. Uh, and that's when I had finished the manuscript and then sent it in during the pandemic. Um, I mean, it was inspired by my daughter. She's hearing impaired. A lot of people kind of confuse that with being deaf. She's not. She's got a hearing loss 
in both the years she wears hearing aids, but it was picked up during, you know, uh, when she was born. You know, at first she failed the hearing test and they thought maybe it was fluid that she had in her ears. That happens like 90% of the time. But we got her retested. And I wasn't too crazy how the doctor delivered the news because it was like your daughter can't hear. And it like really, really sent me back a little bit because I was just, you know, it's like a little, you know, shock. I thought she was going to kind of gradually tell us, you know, she has a hearing loss. It happens, you know, one out of like a thousand kids it happens to today. And I think it's more now. Um, so we caught it early and the hearing aids ex helped extremely. She speaks perfect, you know. Um, I was, again, a little taken, taken back by it, but again, adapting with it. So I was in, you know, we go to Greece every summer, you know, her, her, my ex's family's from, from a beautiful uh, area in Greece. So we go to Greece every summer and I spent a lot of time with her in Greece. We were driving, you know, from, from the airport, uh, we were in Athens, we were driving, we passed by a marina. And I just, you know, I'm, I'm like an idea guy. I like to kind of like, but I like to follow through on my ideas. I'm like, wouldn't it be cool to maybe work on an animated show about a little girl who lived at a marina? And I'm like, Athena, marina, Athena visits the marina. And I'm like, and I'm thinking all like, I planted the seed. And I was like, you know what? I had it in my subconscious. I finally decided, well, let me walk before I run. I've been spending a lot of time. In, in uh, Barnes and Noble and in, in, in children's bookstores. I'm sure you go to bookstores with your kids, right? So I started doing, I started picking out books and reading books and I'm like, wow, why don't I just like start it as a children's book? And that's kind of like how it all happened. That I went to um, uh, a publisher. They loved the idea. Um, and the name of the book is called Athena Visits the Marine. And it's about a little girl and her daily routine, you know, waking up, putting her hearing aids in, doing her routine, having breakfast, brushing her teeth, very basic, very cute, basic stuff, uh, going to school. Uh, and then that one weekend, uh, her parents take her to the marina for the first time. And she communicates with sea animals and an aquarium that's at the marina via her hearing aids. I did the research. I didn't see a lot of books out there with, you know, kids with a hearing loss and hearing aids. So I was like, wow, I did, you know, I want to do this for my daughter and from the heart. And I, I, was, I got, you know, a lot of support from her, you know, uh, my ex's mom and dad, Papu and Yaya, which they call them in Greek, grandparents are called Papu and Yaya. And I want to, you know, I want to really, I want to really say thank you to them for supporting the project. Uh, and they thought it was just beautiful for a dad even wanting to do that. So it kind of like organically happened, but it was in, it was in the back of my mind for a, for a few years. And the pandemic had me shift to adapting to being like, you know what, the movie business is kind of like on hold. The screenplays that I wrote, they're kind of on hold. I'm not going to be auditioning for a little bit. Who knows? I said, a, you know, a children's book could be turned into an audio book, a visual electronic book, and a physical book. That's not going to change. I, you know, I buy children's books for my kids. So I'm like, let me adapt. Let me change. Uh, and everyone that I've spoken to about it, I've gotten extreme support from a lot of people. They're like, this is really cute. This is really beautiful. And I think it's going to do really well. And like I said earlier, I do things from the heart. I do things that are authentic. Uh, and I just think it's going to be great for the hearing loss community and for all kids. They're just going to love this little girl communicating like sea animals at the marina and at the aquarium. Uh, and there's some magical words in the book that are explained at the end of the book. So there's like a little lesson at the end where there's like a key of like 13 magical words that were in the book that also teaches the kids like for a word, like a word like ecstatic. It'll explain it at the end of the book what that means. So I'm really, I'm really proud and excited. Uh, I love movies and TV, but this project I'm really, really excited about because again, I know everyone says that their kids are the most gorgeous kids in the world, but she's, really something beautiful and special. Um, and she knows it's about her because I'm like, daddy's writing a book. You know, it's, a, you know, what well, you know the name of the book. She's like, Athena visits the marina. And I just picked out an illustrator with the, um, you know, from the help of the, uh, the uh, publisher sending, you know, illustrations. And I picked out a really beautiful illustrator and I'm really, really excited uh, about this illustrator. So it's looking at, it's looking like I'd say fall. So it'll be out this fall. Wow, yeah, what a beautiful project, Gino, and I love the hustle that you had there to take advantage of the opportunity of the pandemic, as you said, you know, shooting in, in, in films has been down, and, and everything has kind of been shut down here, and uh, uh, taking advantage of the time uh, is awesome to see, and then switching gears here, um, going from the, the children's book, so your, one of your latest movies here, Capone, 
What was the, uh, which is a, quite a big shift here. What was, that's, 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 the, that's the 180. I like, that's like people, that's what I, I love to throw the monkey wrench because a lot, you know, a lot, you know, I love comedy. I grew up loving comedy. I grew up with the, with the honeymooners, Jackie Gleason, Ralph Cramden. I'm like a huge honeymooners fan. I, you know, I was always the class clown. Um, but somehow I always kind of get called to play, you know, the heavy, the bad guy, you know, cause I got, I got a scar when I fell when I was a kid, I always get called in to play the heavy. So, you know, doing a movie like Capone, I don't know if you've seen it, but there's, there's certain things in the movie, like you see the good and the bad of my character. So to shift from doing a movie like Capone and playing like an enforcer and playing like Al Capone's right hand man, who's done some stuff for him in the past. Um, and to writing, you know, a, a children's book, it's kind of like a 180. And I kind of like throwing that monkey wrench because uh, a lot of um, people in the industry and fans and audience, they're like, you always play the bad guy, right? Or the, or the gangster or the, no, I, I've done other TV where I played, you know, uh, a police officer on Ray Donovan, or I played uh, a Long Island dad and bad, bad education that's on, um, on HBO right now with Hugh Jackman. Like, I, I play different roles, but some, somehow they kind of, like, always say, you, well, you play the bad guy, and you look like the bad guy. But but I'm like a teddy bear. So, in a way, again, it organically happened. It went from doing a movie like Capone that just released on VOD to now people kind of, like, hearing about my children's book. And they're like, wow, that's a big, big shift. That, But that's what I do. I, I kind of yeah. want to throw in a monkey wrench, you know? I love the fact that the, the movie covers the later part of Capone's. I mean, I, I've read several books on Capone. I'm always fascinated by his story. And this is a guy that, that rose to the top of the, uh, of the crime families in, uh, in Chicago in his mid-20s. I mean, he was he's such a young guy when he did all yep. this stuff. And uh, it's awesome that it focuses on his later years, which a lot of non people don't, don't, know too, don't know too much about. So uh, I thought that was pretty cool. What type of, um, uh, when shooting does resume here, what type of projects or plans do you have lined up uh, for the future? Well, I wrote, um, again, I, I kind of try to write what I know. Um, so I wrote a, a script that's kind of like a, almost a follow, not a follow up, but almost in the same world. Uh, I developed a film that's on Hulu right now, uh, right now called Cruise that was written and directed by Rob Siegel. He wrote The Wrestler. We worked on a film called Big Fan a few years back and he wrote and directed that. But I brought him a short story that I had written and shot uh, and I was going to pitch it as a pilot. He wanted to do it as a film. Um, so we wind up doing it as a, as a movie. So uh, again, I write from what I know. So, uh, I just wrote a script about a girl that, uh, is pretty much from the same neighborhood from where the, the cruise world was. Um, she's a waitress, um, that works in a diner. I don't want to give too much away, but it's a girl, girl power, girl driven script, which, mo you know, most likely, I, I want to link up a great female director. I wanted it to be more of a girl empowerment type of type of script and film. Uh, and then I, I wrote another film uh, that takes place in 1999 with a co-writer. So those are the two, uh, you know, projects that I'm involved as a writer. Uh, and then I have some other stuff in the works. Knock on wood. Let's see, uh, you know, how uh, stuff opens up in L.A. Uh, but I'm shooting a pilot, uh, a comedy pilot with a, with a close friend of mine. Uh, we're doing a pilot in uh, in LA um, and working on a, a, a PSA, which uh, again just changing, you know, shifting gears, adapting. I've never worked on a PSA. Yeah, well, I've never worked on a PSA for, before. So again, I got try to adapt and do things a little different. And I know that most production companies are looking for uh, either minimal crew or you know minimal performers. You know, uh, again, the op you know every state is opening up in phases. I don't know when. You know, the New York filming phase will, will open up or the L.A. phase, how that's going to open up. Um, but again, the key word, uh, adapting. And then I dabbled just for fun. I was, I was um, you know, a lot of people have been doing a lot of cooking in quarantine. Um, I love to cook. My mom's a great cook. Um, so I, I took a shot at making chicken meatballs for the first time and I filmed it. I cut it up as like a little sizzle. I'm like, you know, I did it for fun. Maybe I'll pitch it as a cooking show. Um, but I did it more, more for fun, but a lot of people are responding to that. So again, who knows where, it, you know, where my next kind of like passion project lies. But again, sometimes things happen organically and they come out of left field.
Yeah, good stuff. And last thing I want to hit you with here, Gino, I love to ask all the dads that I get on the podcast, what type of advice do you have for the new dad or for that about-to-be father who's out there listening? Um, new dads, whether it's a boy or girl, um, what's that 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 uh, word that when you had to fold the... Um, when the swaddle? Kid, there you go. Be a great swaddler. <laughs> <laughs> Because I was kind of like, I, I kind of like mastering. I actually was like, they're like, oh my God, you're so good at it. But um, th that was a joke. Uh, patience. I guess patience is, uh, is, I guess, the number one thing. Patience. Um, because it, it's going to be different. But just like a best friend that, that has told me in the past with anything in life, whether it's personal or work, um, it's new in the beginning. But just like anything else, it becomes normal as time goes by. So like I, you know, like being a dad was like so new and shocking, but then when it became a way of life and, and um, every day just became even more beautiful and, and spend, spend time, spend time with your kids because I'm thinking she's going to be seven. It's yesterday that she was just born. So like time goes very quick, you know, so spend a lot of time, you know, spend a lot of time. I know dads, dads get busy, but there is enough time to go around. You just kind of have to prioritize the time. Yeah, very well said. I love the message. It's been an honor for me. I got to say, Gino Caffarelli, you're a first-class father all the way. And thank you so much for giving me a few minutes of your time here on First Class Fatherhood. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure being here. I really love what you're doing. Thank you.